quietly as possible, if that is, if that is uh, not too intrusive a command or a request. Um, and if you can start directing your attention to the, these wonderful uh, panelists we have. Uh, what we are going to talk about uh, on this panel is, is the, the sort of, the heart of reform in any country is not the, the laws which have to change, but the culture that has to change. And in a country like Ukraine, uh, that issue is at the center of the reform process, which is can you change what has been, let us be honest, a culture of corruption in this society. Uh, and it's an important moment to be talking about this because the sense that the ruling elites of, the, of a country are corrupt and out of touch is not a problem that Ukraine faces alone. In fact, it's a, it is probably the most widespread problem in the Western world today. If you look at countries from Greece to Sweden, Hungary to uh, Denmark, you see the, a rise of populism. And of course, now you see that phenomenon in the United States as well. And what all these places have in common is the sense that the elites are out of touch, they're corrupt, and that therefore the voice of the people has to be heard in some other way. And so it seems to me that uh, in this gathering of elites, uh, and whether you like it or not, you are all in some way implicated. Um, we need to talk about this. I thought I'd start actually from a non-Ukrainian perspective and ask Anders Fogras Musin, who was prime minister of a prosperous northern European country, secretary general of NATO, who has had to deal with these issues. Um, sorry. Um, why do you think that in countries as prosperous as yours, or in Sweden, um, places that are doing well, you even there have this, um, this rise of anti-elitism, populism, and a sense that people uh, are worried about the corruption of elites? Uh, <clears throat> I think the main reason is that irrespective of the level of wealth, people do believe that the elites do not take their concerns seriously. For instance, in the north of Europe, um, immigration, refugee pressure have played a great role. But my main point is that the populists are not unbeatable. They can be dealt with. We did that in my country. Based on my experience, I would say three things are necessary. Firstly, um, firstly, you have to make a bargain, so to speak. A bargain in which you accept some of their points in exchange for them accepting the rest of your reform agenda. Secondly, you should prepare your reforms carefully. Uh, we establish commissions, uh, committees, etc. We have broad public debates because what can't be explained can't be defended. So you have to really explain this very carefully. And thirdly, I think it's of utmost importance that we take their concerns seriously. Uh, so, uh, in Europe, I do believe that we should do more effectively to address people's concerns regarding immigration. Um, we can elaborate further on that, uh, but that's my take on it. They are not unbeatable. It's a real problem, but it can be addressed. Uh, Pat Cox, the European Parliament. Uh, how do you see this problem of, of this widespread rise of anti-elitism and populism? I think, firstly, there are a number of uh, 
explanatory factors. Some of them have been touched on in panels here uh, yesterday with the American uh, debate we had. The questions of perceived or actual winners and losers from globalization. Because of course sometimes the perceptions are not statistically validated. They have what Stephen Colbert has described as truthiness. What people feel is true rather than what may be actually verifiably true. And these dimensions, both real and perceived, are there. I think an element is demographics. A lot of Western society and a lot of Europe is uh, aging. And a lot of people who are approaching that stage of their life feel anxieties about uh, what their place is, what their welfare will be. And it's my guess that some of the debate, for example, in the United States, if I look at your demographics, is that a lot of the classic white Caucasian American citizen is kind of very European. Small families, low rate of family reproduction, aging. And in this sense that it's, it, it seems, it feels very familiar uh, to, any, to any European. I think also the way discourse has developed, the way we discuss our politics, I think we have coarsened our politics over time. This is not some sense of you know, nostalgia for a wonderful past, but I think the focus on issues, on being evidence-led, on being fair and proportionate in what you're trying to debate or analyze is now a bit more secondary to name-calling, characterization, character assassination. And I find it very amusing sometimes to listen to some persons who are elected or who wish to be elected to describe other persons who have been elected and dismiss them as elite. When one thing I have to say, from my very ordinary family background with no political connection, that I don't and never felt elitist. I never elected myself to a parliament. I never elected myself to lead a group. I never elected myself to be the president of the European Parliament. It was through democracy. And one difficulty I've got with some of the language about elitism in some of our debates is that, in fact, it undermines democracy itself by regarding those who step up, who go before the public, and who get elected as being capable of being dismissed easily as an elite. Now, I know it's a small number, and I know then the issue, and you've touched on it, and I think for Ukraine, and I don't want to get into Ukraine prematurely in the debate, but the issue here and in other places when you put elitism with corruption. Now, now you've got the real problem because the elusive quality of finding the national interest uh, is something that falls into second or third place. And when you've got elite uh, corruption, and I think you're, you're quite right, it embeds itself in a system with high levels of impunity, low levels of accountability, almost no transparency. These are the preconditions that permit it to happen and sustain itself. And in the end, with this kind of elitist uh, corruption, the culture point you make is true. I'll finish with this. I've had the privilege in the past uh, 15 uh, months or so to work very closely with the uh, groups, uh, the fractions in the Verkhovna Rada and with the speaker and his staff on looking at capacity building and reform in the parliament here. And I quoted Peter Drucker at the end of my first report. Uh, the... We have a lot of recommendations, and I made one, one observation. This parliament has more rules written down than any parliament we could find. These rules are actually the law of the land, not just the procedures of the parliament itself. These rules are more often ignored than followed. And so I concluded, if all the things we recommended were to be put in the rules, but were to be ignored as comprehensively as today's rules, that it could make no difference, and quoted Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast. That if you put a meal of strategy change on the table, but you don't address the underlying cultural issues, that the culture will consume the strategy and you risk to end up back where you started. So, so let's then talk about uh, Ukraine and, and uh, this perception, which I think is rooted in uh, in reality, and there's many anecdotes and much data about it, which is the, the sense of, uh, of pervasive corruption. Um, Alexandra Daniluk, um, you are in the uh, 
position of having to do something about this. Um, when people from out the outside look at Ukraine, they feel this is a hopeless case. The, co the co corruption is just too pervasive to ever imagine anything changing. What do you tell them? Thank you for the question. Well, if you don't mind, I will briefly comment on... Uh, yes, you, you started with, uh, uh, with hypothesis that people are around the world, they're actually anti-elite. They, they kind of, it's a general, general move, really. Uh, the question is really, uh, you know, whether the country can live in the world without a leaf, uh, without a lead, or maybe it's just a process of forming, of forming, of forming new lead, and what this lead would be will define the the future of of, of our culture, of our countries. Uh, in Ukraine, yes, if you speak with a lot of people in the country, and by the way, if you speak with people who, um, you know, outside Ukraine. The corruption comes as uh, number one topic, and been for years. It's been for years, and elite definitely responsible for that, because the policy making um, is dominated actually by people who who possess um, economic economic resources. They can actually work directly, or they can act by proxies. Um, you know, political parties even NGOs, um, that's a reality. That needs to be changed. And uh, it would only change by putting new rules in place. And one of the important issue, one important um, point uh, to make is that the closed country, and Ukraine was closed country, is actually preserves the old elites. We're opening up, we're opening up very quickly uh, with the EU, right, with other countries, the amount of work that we've done to open the country is enormous over the last few years. And that actually by itself creates grounds for changing elites because it dilutes economic power, uh, sorry, financial powers, local financial powers, by bringing new people, uh, investing in the country. Uh, it also uh, brings new um, skills which are of value. Because now we need new elite who actually do not benefit from links in old world and other Republic of Soviet Union. We're bringing in people who can benefit and not just benefit, but actually can make Ukraine benefit from understanding global trends. This is a new elite. And uh, if we talk about corruption now, uh, you know, with all these trends, situation will improve, but corruption needs to be tackled. It needs to be tackled, and the way it's tackled is, uh, there are several ways. Uh, I think everybody would agree that the amount of work that was done to put in place the system for fighting corruption, this is creation of anti-corruption, National Anti-Corruption Bureau, Agency for Prevention Corruption, launching electronic declaration system, is something that put in place, this combination, it put in place the system that basically leave no hope for corruption to, to remain. It will take time, right? It doesn't happen overnight. But this system becomes very, very uh, effective. Uh, so I think this is, this is the key. Thanks. Um, Mikhail Saakashvili, you, uh, you tackled corruption in Georgia and you're now operating in uh, Ukraine. Describe for us whether you think this is a battle that can be won. How does it compare to what you've seen in Georgia? I know you know Russia well, um, you know, how would you describe the situation? It's very comparable and uh, when you talk about Ukrainian elite, I think they are more or less, all of them are children of uh, my good friend President Kuchma, who was extremely efficient in doing many things, including the fact that he basically, the whole entire Ukrainian elite that exists, was formed under his auspices. Now, but the thing, and everybody who is there, who is there right now, They've been changing positions for times. They've been in the government. They've been in the opposition, again in the government. But they stayed intact. And the problem that what, where Ukraine failed, that this elite failed to evolve. And we have a situation when Ukraine is at war with Russia. But from my standpoint, as we stand today, Ukrainian elite very much shares the same values as the Russian elite. 
It basically has very little in common with the European or American or any other mainstream elites. Their mentions are exactly, mentions in Conchas Asp are exactly of the same size as mentions in Rublovka. They still lead the same lifestyle. They live on rent from the commodities. And basically not much unchanged. So as a result, it's a closed system which brought Ukraine to the situation when it's the, in terms of uh, GDP, the poorest country in Europe. That's the sum up overall of the activity of this or inactivity of this elite. So how do, how would it, how would to change it? And then, you know how Ukrainian government is run, that's my experience. It's like a closed, it's like a joint stock society, oligarchs, big oligarchs having their stock. It changes from time to time, it evolves depending what's happening, right? But they have their joint stock society. They appoint their CEO, who is a prime minister, or president, depends who has more power at that moment. Then they have uh, the council of directors, these are ministers. But they also have uh, the supervisory council, which can be just MPs or just shadow figures, you just name them. And that's how the country is run. And these decisions are taken not necessarily by ministers, but by basically this, uh, this board that consists of people who might be in parliament or not in parliament, who might be even abroad, even uh, you know, uh, wanted by law enforcement, but they still might be running this or the other sector of the economy. So, and the way how it works is that, for instance, Minister Daniluk, who is a very reform-minded guy, he has the head of tax police who is also sitting in this hall. And he might say, and he can fire him formally at any moment. But the head of tax police was put there by some shadow figure in parliament whom nobody has seen as his speeches or anything, but he's one of the wealthiest guys in the country. He runs the, he controls the tax service, he gets corrupt income from tax service and buys MPs. And if Mr. Daniluk fires his subordinate, Mr. Nasiro, then Mr. Nasiro's head can fire the entire government of Ukraine with no problem like this. Uh, and <laughs> as a result, they are all sitting in one hall and continuing the stalemate. And how do you break through to this? And the way how we break through this, you bring in new generation. Uh, and this is already happening after second Maidan. First Maidan failed to deliver that. With second Maidan, you have people who have been young MPs like Mustafa, deputy ministers, even ministers, uh, you know, head of tax service, head of customs in Odessa, Yulia Maruszewska. For the first time in the history of Odessa, customs is not corrupt. Everybody can confirm that in Odessa. That never had never happened before. Corruption, Odessa, and customs were always the same thing in mentality of everybody who dealt with Odessa. Now, the problem with her is that she, it is only one customs. Everybody's against her. They don't give her appointment. They don't give her computer system. They don't give her even her building. And it's entirely artificial situation. They were holding it with our teeth, but it's artificial. Either the whole system takes over again, or we manage to replace the system. The same things happened with open public space we built there, where you have all the other public spaces exactly the opposite. You don't have electronic registers in Ukraine because whoever controls the information sells it and it cannot have one common space like we had in Georgia. So to obtain any document in Georgia, you need five minutes here, you need uh, in our office like a whole day, in the other things for weeks and bribe. So the reason I'm explaining to you, there is a new generation that, is, that already got a taste of power. They're extremely frustrated because they couldn't realize themselves fully. And they, but they want, they already know how it should look in a normal government. And that generation should be brought in. That generation will be brought in and they have three qualities which the others old ones don't have. First of all, they are, they are, their motivation is not making money. Their motivation is making a country. A fortune that had never been motivation of the old elite. Second thing, these people are willing to take risks. They don't have much to lose. I mean, they've already seen. And that's important because in the reform system, we have to take risks. Third one is very important for me. They are mostly educated in the West or understand Western values. They, are, they share Western values, but they don't have this kind of imitation thing, let us follow everything blindly. Because they share values, because they understand, because they like the West, they are willing to act independently, understanding their country. All the elite, Absolutely doesn't share the values of the West, but they're scared of the West like to, like to hell because, you know, it's a very dangerous thing to not to defy. The, as a result, for instance, in the customs, for three months we say, we don't reform the customs, we wait for accommodations coming from a board of American advisors. I can write you beforehand what they will write. They will write all the right things, except that we didn't have to wait for three months. We could have started it on our own. Country has to perform on its own. And the way how we bring these people into power is through elections. The, right now, it wasn't the case after Second Maidan. After Second Maidan, people looked around and they still, there is nobody else. So let's take the old ones, control them, and they'll maybe do it better this time. They didn't. 
So what you do now, you already have these new guys who should be ele elevated from the status of troublemakers to the status of decision makers. Right now they are all troublemakers. And they all make troubles in customs, in financial services, in parliament. You know, they disturb people, the, the old systems attacks them back, but they are not decision makers. The new elections, whoever is run, wherever it's run, will bring in entirely new people. There will be anti-systemic revolution that swallow away because people think, oh, this girl has always been around, so out, no matter what she says. This guy has always been around, out. We need new people. And once you get new people, this will be a new motivation that Ukraine gets. This is when you ask about Georgia, it's exactly the same thing happened in Georgia. In Georgia, we had people we, like me, I was Minister of Justice, Deputy Minister of Things, who wanted to do something good, never were allowed to, but they were already in government, and they knew how it worked. We have the guys who introduced Prozoro, the trend tender system. We have other guys who really did small things that made a difference. Mr. Roshkovan, National Bank, other people, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Nefodov, etc. You just allow them to do likes of Maruszewska. And in the end, finally, I'm optimistic. Why? Because Ukraine, unlike Russia, had uh, experience, they have historical experience. We have historical experience of uh, self governing cities, Magdeburg law. We have historic experience of Austro Hungarian Empire, which is more or less institutional, you know, running institutions, uh, uh, you know, uh, at least till uh, the 20th century. And we have historic, Ukraine has. It never had, first of all, commodities are down, good thing for Ukraine. Uh, second, uh, most big part of East is lost temporarily, temporarily, but in a way there are benefits to be extracted from them. And the West and East of Ukraine, South and North, have never been so close to each other in terms of thinking and uh, understanding of how situations should be changed. Big chance for Ukraine. The only thing it, we need to bring is to using the democratic spirit of Ukrainian nations to usher in this new generation within next six months, nine months, maximum year to power. And things will start to move very fast. Thank you. Yuri Lutsenko, um, uh, Chief Prosecutor of, of Ukraine. Let me ask you um, what Mikhail just described was a very rational system of corruption, by which I mean uh, the person in, in the people in parliament who have economic power want to preserve it using political power. And it's not a, a matter of a small bribe here or there, that it is a system that maintains that economic power through political power. How do you change that? It's easy to understand how you reform a uh, bureaucracy or an administration and get policemen not to take bribes. But this is fundamental corruption, which is a much higher stakes game, uh, which is entirely rational. First of all, I would like to disagree that uh, we have a turbulence against the elites, because the government that was before Maidan, I cannot call them elite. I would like to say that just one case that we are now investigating uh, the, against the old tax system, the damage amounts to $40 billion stolen from the budget of Ukraine. Therefore, these are not the elite, this is the government mafia that was overthrown during the revolutionary events. At this time, Ukraine is the, at the time of two wars. We are fighting the Kremlin at the east, and we are fighting the corruption all over Ukraine. At both wars, there are soldiers. At both wars, there are also these couch experts. So the soldiers are not the ones that always win the battle, but they are fighting. The couch experts are always flawless, and they earn a lot on real estate by preparing their own political experts. I support the criticism, but I would like to hear constructive ideas. My friend Mikhail Saikashvili is right in supporting the young generation. I also agree with that, but I would like that generation which already obtains and has 
a parliamentary uh, mandate to interfere into specific process and be helping those people who are working, even if those people there are helping sometimes make mistakes. I, I became the, the prosecutor general at the time when the prosecution was the embodiment of the evil. At Francis Underwood once said, it is better to uh, really um, saddle the horse than sit on and, and watch them race. So what we have done uh, is basically there are three levels of the quest for the country to feel that the law is the same for everyone. And I think we've finished the first level quite good when the managers of various government institutions, the former and the current government, were held liable, were uh, captured, are arrested, and are w waiting in the cells for the beginning of the trial. I'm talking about the deputy governor of the National Bank, the deputy head of Naftagaz, the son of the current member of the parliament. I'm talking about the head of the regional prosecutor who spearheaded uh, the mafia the Amber Mafia, and I'm talking about one other, other members of the parliament who was organizing the separatist movement in the east of Ukraine. I'm talking about a large commercial a bank manager who've, who've stolen money from um, uh, dozens of thousands of people. I'm talking about the killers of the Maidan participants. I'm talking about the deputy gov uh, governors, the acting governors who, uh, who are now prosecuted by the general prosecutor's office. I do understand that the prosecution itself is not important, but getting it to the trial and to the court ruling. And the first the, the, the deputy uh, governor who have taken the bribe is now in the court. If the court gives him a real prison imprisonment, the law doesn't envisage anything else. The country will come to a new uh, condition, new reality. It will mean that the evil can be punished here and now in Ukraine. It's important to talk about the second tier. Of as these are members of the parliament, untouchable parliament members and judges. We are cooperating here with the National Anti-Corruption Bureau and we are working together on the initial case. But also the prosecution is also preparing a number of submissions to the parliament to hold uh, the parliament members and judges liable. And this is the second level of the quest that I'm planning to have completed yet this year. The third level, the third tier is the oligarch. This is the most important problem in Ukraine because it holds back the competition. It keeps generating new types of politicians. This parliament has more than 50% of the new members of the parliament. Nothing has changed in the political culture because it's being generated by these old same oligarchs. They are preserving the economy. They, they are conserving the policy. And how do you get them? That's the hardest bit. But nevertheless, we're still following that track. And I would like to point out one other thing that I am committed to. I don't think that the most important in my job is to calculate the number of uh, imprisoned and arrested criminals. It is true, but that's only a little bit of that. I will demonstrate to you what I mean very visually. Ukraine needs water. Our budget is empty. The salary of an uh, ordinary teacher is $150 a month. We have to keep that in mind. The budget has been stolen by the previous government and it's not being replenished because of the corruption and the oligarch monopolies now. People are thirsty of water. They want to have the water, but the budget, this glass, this cup, it has a hole in it. There's a hole, it's, it leaks. That's nafta gas in the bottom, and that's Anishin Kokes, Lechevsky. These are cases. This is the Amber Mafia, the $800,000 uh, of cash per day. This is the stolen Mali, one and a half thousand hectares of land that was brought back to the government, 750 in Kharkiv, we're bringing back. Here's our forests and other natural riches of Ukraine, and it's empty. I have nothing to give to the teacher, to the worker, to the scientist, to the soldier. Therefore, my task, or, so the task that I see for Ukraine, I think this to be a joint task, not only just for the prosecutor's office, but for the prosecutor's office, for the parliament, for the opposition, for the coalition, is 
to make sure that once we find these uh, leaking uh, holes to have them plugged, not to be able to throw, to steal from the Africans, because if I keep arresting one guy, the others will come in to stop um, uh, the theft of uh, Amber Mafia, because even I'm afraid the guy who does it, but I'm afraid that the new SBU guy or the police guy will come in and, and be doing the same. So we have to stop that on the legislative level. We'll stop the, the smuggling of the, our forest, which was 50% of the total volume. So, But it, it requires rules. The government cannot be only a punitive instrument. The government has to identify for the prosecutors the crime uh, concentration and have them closed in a civilized way. I don't exclude that these guys will be arrested, but this takes the economic activities of the parliament and the ministries to destroy this economic as an economic phenomenon. I know it takes years, but we are moving forward on that path. And I would like to remind this uh, president uh, who was brought because of Mr. Pachuk to Kiev, Francis Underwood also said before you change no to yes, there's always possible word, the word possible. So the trust to the law enforcement block of Ukraine, I think I want it to change to maybe from no. And uh, if we work together, we will also reach the yes point. Yes, we can. Well, that, that, that was a very powerful um, and passionate uh, case, again, for the idea that this is a very deep-rooted problem, that it is something that if you don't get at the fundamental uh, part of it, the, 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 the part I think that, again, Mikhail was talking about, that what you have here is economic power that is trying to protect its economic power by using political power to drain Ukraine's treasuries. Um, if you look at the latest Transparency International rankings, Ukraine is still ranked the most corrupt country in Europe. It is ranks 126th in the world. So Mustafa, when you listen to this, what do you think needs to happen in parliament, in, in you know, among the kind of powers that be in Ukraine to change it? Thank you very much. First of all, I want to start from past from Mr. Lutsenko about helping member of parliament to the government, to the president, and to support them. You know, really, I'm ready to support, and all our team of young politicians are ready to support. And we are doing every day. I know that Mr. Lysenko and I was smiling, but I will tell you how it could be. You know, to make this glass not empty, it is not about parliament. It is about legislation you write. We are inviting you to our meeting. We will describe you how to do that. But we should start not from that. We should start from not sitting with oligarchs in president's cabinet with you, Mr. Lutsenko, and Minister of Interior, and Prosecutor General, and Secretary of Council of Security of Ukraine, sharing country. This is not my words. Mr. Kolomoisky openly declared that he was sitting with Mr. Lutsenko, Mr. Avakov, Mr. Poroshenko, and Turchinov. He's public to do that. I can show you this interview. Just read it. Okay, but you, you never told that. You even didn't command that. From the other side, when we are talking about these holes in this glass, one of it is energy. And tell me, please, what we did with energy monopoly of Mr. Ahmedov for two years, do we have some rules for them? We have it. Let's put legislation. We proposed it with our colleagues about independent regulator. But who is top that? Block Poros Poshoroshenko. Who is top that? Narodny Front. It is our support. We are ready to support you. And this is true. We are on the one side. But publicly. In back office, you are sitting with that guys, dealing. And then you are not talking about turbulence with the leads. I will tell you what is turbulence. Actually, no, I think that historical mission of Mr. Poroshenko and those teams who are now running country was not to be strong as the teams who are now running country, but put strong institutions. The principles, they are now forming government, forming their teams are the same with Mr. Yanukovych's time. It's just a little bit weaker. 
The main principle is that we should be strong. But who is we? Our team, those who are agree with us, those who are ready to share with us country, those who are ready to cover our crimes, those are we. But we thought that you should do like Mecenats, not like investors in your teams. Mecenats it means you should serve country. You should serve to people. And we are, should be country, not your teams. Look what they have now. They're putting general prosecutor, which is really common. You are common, but who is common? Who gave those votes? I will tell you, maybe it's very strange for you, but those people who actually was in part of region. They think that this general prosecutor is common also. This is the reality we have. And when we are talking about troublemakers, we really are troublemakers, but not because we want to make troubles, because we are not satisfied with the efficiency and transparency of this government and this president also. And our idea is just not use your power against those who want to help you. What you are doing now, this government doesn't have will to fight corruptions. We are, attacking, we are talking about lack of will to fight monopolies. But at the same time, the same prosecutor, the same secret service, they have will to follow us, to make surveillance, to put publicly those fakes about us. They are fighting us, actually. Listen, what we are talking about, Mr. Lutsenko, just two years ago, we were standing on one side of barricades, and now you're attacking and avoiding discussion with us. This is not a good idea, I think. Why it happened so? And what we are talking about? What is the tools of our fight? This is Cold War inside elites now in Ukraine. But the tools are different. What tools they have? They have media, they have money, they have all these law enforcement agencies, and they're fighting us. What we have? We are still weak, unfortunately. We should recognize it. But we have much more stronger weapon. First is transparency, freedom of speech, and accountability. We're asking that. But they're using their power against us. And who will win? I don't know who will win, but I know who will lose. Country will lose. The country you and me are living here now. And that's the problem. So when we are talking about these new principles, I think, first of all, stop talk about names. Let's talk about principles. We are not in different side of barricade now. What, why you are talking about some member of parliament? It's not your level, actually. We should show different level of dignity, different level of discussion. And this discussion should be about different things. We are going to join global world, but in this global world, we have Panama uh, documents and Panama paper scandals. In our country, if you are doing something like Panama did, you are enemy. And that is the logic of these elites. You can be in two roles, or enemy or slave. You cannot criticize them. If you criticize them, you are experts on the divan. If you criticize them, you are working for Russia. If you criticize them, you are populist. But again and again, we went to the parliament, we entered the power to propose decision. When we are really have the solutions with civil society, which are united now against these things like you did in general prosecutor. And, and the final point is just what Mr. Saakashvili told to us about to support us. You know, I think that I hope the top consequence of this dialogue will be our joining our teams. And it is my proposition to talk about that finally, eventually, because everyone is waiting for that. But we should be very aware what we are doing now. We are not attacking president or government or Mr. Lutsenko. But from the other side, because I know that Mr. Lutsenko put a lot of effort to do good things inside prosecutor office. Really, I know you want to do that. But even you are hostage of those old links. And we understand that. And only one reason and one way to be free from this 
you know, jail of links. Refresh your team. Bring new people who are not linked. Look what we did in Ministry of Economy when Prozora team came there. They actually did it because they were not linked to any governor, to any ministry, to any oligarch. Look what we've done in police. The same thing, because new people did it. Look what's going on now in Naftogaz. You are the same thing. They are trying to build up new corporation, but now, you know, yesterday we have this raider attack in one of the companies of Naftogaz. So, my final point, please, don't accept us as troublemakers. We want to help you, but don't, please, fight us because eventually country will lose. We will come, it is eventually, it is, you know, this is not a question, it's a matter of time, that new generation will come. But what will leave after you, you should leave stronger institutions, not stronger teams. Thank you. Yuri, why don't you give a, a quick response? Taking into account that Mustafa was asking not to ask names, although he asked, he mentioned me at least 15 times, so I think I guess I need to answer. Well, first of all, the prosecution has to change, of course. And uh, Mr. Mustafa, maybe you don't know, but out of my five deputies, three are people under 35 who have never worked in the prosecution before. You may not know this, but it is now, as we speak, there is a selection for every third local prosecutor, open, transparent, based on the Western standards. Maybe you do not know, but there is a, the, uh, the call for proposal for 500 uh, prosecutors of the local prosecutions based on the Western standards. We have raised their salaries twice, so the minimum will be $14,000, uh, 14,000 uh, grivnia, which is $500. And this means that people can come from outside the system to work there. We are working on this. We are also working to clean uh, up the existing, um, existing uh, staff and personnel. So the general inf possibility of inf they, my request, they gave me 60 to uh, information. The whole country is fighting against corruption and they know only 62 cases that they could inform me about. Only that. So that is why, together with American colleagues, we are creating the general inspection to select uh, the manager. There are 99 candidates. They will have the double salary and with e-declaration and the integrity checks, they will clean up all the traitors, all the bribers from the prosecution. We're working on this. But one other important thing I wanted to mention is that I'm not a captive to that, uh, to those uh, circumstances. I was free in the prison under Yanukovych, and I'm free uh, under in the prosecution office. I participated in two Maidans. My son was the ordinary soldier in the artillery near Donetsk airport. I will not let anyone to stop me, no matter who is under investigation. I will guarantee this with my name, which is known in this country. I think everything is will be all right if we stop dividing ourselves into young, fluffy, white angels and the old, ugly demons. So it's not divided by age. It's not divided by parties or by regions. The criminals don't have party affiliations. And the blabbers don't have uh, age. It's just these people have to be pushed away, some behind the bars, some on their couch. And those who want to work, I stretch my hand to you, including to you, Mustafa. The Underwood who said yesterday, he presented that sometimes uh, there are uh, the best enemies uh, who, uh, the best friends can sometimes up because I'm guessing the that worst, there are uh, many, many passionate uh, views in the room here, but I'm going to start by calling on someone. Uh, Dmitry Shimkev, from the, uh, looking at it from your point of view, you were at Microsoft, now you are in the presidential administration. Um, what again, what, what Mikhail Shakash really talks about, it seems to me, is the heart of the issue, which is the corruption is, is, the, is based on a rational system of self-preservation of power and money for a very powerful set of people in, in Ukraine. Can you, uh, can you tackle corruption 
when you have this power base for it. Thank you very much. I know that um, I, I need to pass the microphone next to my colleague, but um, I think I would like to echo what Yuri just said. If we do not close the loopholes that everybody has been using and happily enjoying them, the corruption will continue to flourish. If we look in, and today was an interesting um, discussion because when we had a, a, a discussion on the panel on the corruption, uh, I think we're doing a lot to eliminate corruption. Do we do in enough? No. But there is a cases by cases, facts by facts, where the corruption been stopped, the barriers been introduced, the creativity of those who've done corruption going to a new level. So the trust will come where people and the state budget will have more money, where people have better jobs, where people get better pay, where they actually, we hold the discussion about tariffs, needs to be brought to discussion, not about how high they are and how people can pay them. And this is a question about back to the economic discussion. So I think the trust towards elites starts with the what is done. And I think the whole question about putting somebody behind the jail starts with the courts. The courts needs to prove the innocence or guiltiness. And that's a great work that needs to be done by general prosecutor and law enforcement agency to put cases in front. Words are words. And democracy is about ability to defend yourself in the court and as well as the law enforcement to prosecute. And I thank you very much for the panel. Um, other questions uh, from the audience? Um, so, and can you wait for a mic? And the question must be brief and it must have a question mark at the end of it. I've no statements. I'm a lawyer, so I'll try. Uh, Daniel Bilak, a managing partner. Oh, sorry, of sorry, I'm so sorry. I, I, I missed one commentator, and then we'll come to you. My mistake. Thank you. Ladies first. Well, in this case, it's ladies second, but that's all right, Farid. <laughs> um, um, that's all right. For Ukraine, it's all right. Um, first of all, uh, let's ask a simple question. Do we really have a change of elites in Ukraine? The obvious answer is yes. I am a member of uh, the parliament. I'm absolutely new one. As uh, other colleagues of mine who are presented here, if there were not such a process, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you. So the answer is a firm yes. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the data and we look at the Ukrainian parliament, the composition, it says, and it was mentioned by one of the panelists, that we have 50% of the new MPs in Ukrainian parliament right now. But does the quantity equal quality? Do all of those 50% of people represent a group who sincerely wish to change the country, who absolutely sincerely want to build a prosperous country for their own children? I have very much, very many doubts, much doubts about that. And a proof of that is the speed of reforms, the speed of uh, the way the parliament is moving with uh, adopting the so needed legislation. And my next question would be, is the process irreversible? Are we on the right track? Will we see the number of new people with a completely new set of values, including zero tolerance towards corruption? Will we see more of us in the next parliament? Maybe, and maybe it's because we have to admit and be absolutely frank that the old elites, they have a tremendous capacities and abilities to adapt. They are fatted and supported by oligarchs. They are provided financial support. They get access to media and they thrive on populism. And it's interesting to know that there was a research that the level of populism in countries all over the world very much depends on the level of education. The less the level of education of people, the higher the level of populism. So what's the solution to all of that? The solution, in my opinion, is to be thoughtful about our children, about future generations investing into education, uh, making sure that whenever next time comes, people will make intelligent decision 
based on analysis of each and every party, of each and every candidate, what was promised and what was delivered, what and who stands behind political forces, what values do they represent, what they really want to achieve. And here I'm really thankful to Mr. Rasmussen for the lesson that we've heard from him about really involving people into discussion of when it comes to coming up with, uh, with the reform package. We need inclusivity and not pushing for some slogans, populistic slogans. And it takes lots of courage, it takes lots of work, and I encourage my um, colleagues who are presented here to invest into our people, into our children, go and speak to them, explain to, me, to them what is happening. Yes, complaining is the right approach. I mean, revealing the corrupt schemes is the right approach. But we also need to send a strong message what should be done and how it will be achieved to build a prosperous country for our children. So on that note, I will close and say Feras Peradastra and uh, we do believe in our country. Thank you. My name is Daniel Hi, Bilak. Sir. I'm yeah. managing partner of an international law firm here in Kiev. Um, we had a very interesting discussion uh, in the session before this about investment in the country. And there were discussions about rates of return and the need for investment, etc. And I, I think that discussion sort of left Hamlet out of the play because my clients, most of whom are large international companies that would love to invest more, are actually concerned more about their property rights, they're worried about their risk, and as President Kuchma said, they are afraid because we don't have property, they cannot feel secure in their property rights. And unfortunately, and my question is directed to Yuri Vitalich, uh, unfortunately, the seems to be the biggest um, obstacle to investment in the country today is not the deregulation, it's not the tax police to a certain extent, it's the Prokuratura and the courts. This is the biggest problem we have in attracting investment. Is it goes to the heart of an investment decision and that is my property rights. And we have seen a change in, uh, since you've become a uh, uh, prosecutor general. Um, unfortunately, the perception across the world is that the largest mafia in the country is in the Procuratura and in the courts. And my question to you is how are we going to battle this? Do you have a plan to battle this perception? And what is the Procuratura supposed to look like in order to, in order to encourage investment and not discourage it? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question, because for me, this is one of the major issues and questions of my activity. First of all, the Prosecutor General's office has a special point for contact with uh, me personally and my first deputy through a business ombudsman or through a representative of the American Chamber of Commerce or through a diplomatic office of any country. You can talk to us about any problem of any foreign investor. And uh, of course, I agree that there are questions addressed to Procuratura, to the Ministry of Justice, and to many Ukrainian courts. I think I will cope with the resistance of the old dinosaur called the General Prosecutor's Office and we will work through the open contest and we'll get the instrument, the tool for the purge. On the other hand, I also am in favor of a special chamber in the administrative, in the economic court uh, on the issues of investors. And if there was such a specialization of judges selected for contests who would probably have a supervisory board composed of Western lawyers and they would act on the protection of assets and property rights, this would be a very progressive idea. I think that Western lawyers, of course, cannot 
change the decisions and verdicts of Ukrainian judges, but they could assess and evaluate the decisions, and if those breaches of law are systematic, then this judge could be purged. And from my point of view, a special department to look into investment issues, investors issues, could be a huge step forward. I offered this idea to the president of Ukraine, and he is not against this idea. This is not a special court, but this is specialization within the existing system, same as we should introduce the specialization of judges about on the corrupt, corrupt people of A category. Thank you. Uh, and if you can just identify yourself and, and talk about the new venture. So. Thank you, Fareed. Um, Jim Brook of the Ukraine Business Journal. I'd just like to follow up on Danielle's question and the last panel, which set some very ambitious goals of $10, $15 billion worth of investment into the country in coming years, which would be great. But we do have some very high-profile cases, and I think of the Maria case, uh, $1.1 billion of investment, uh, a lot of it coming from London, $300 million stolen. Uh, the police did the, the research, apparently it went to the prosecutor general's office, then it was kicked over to NABU, and no one knows where it is. This is a very high profile case that has to be solved to restore the confidence to get people in London to think again about investing. I was wondering if you could tell us where the Maria case stands. Anders, can you uh, weigh in on this? I don't know what you're going to teach us because I haven't seen Denmark's ranking on the corruption index, but I'm going to assume it's either one, two, or three. Uh, you must be the least corrupt country in the world. What are you going to teach us? We are number one. <laughs> Actually, there is no corruption. So in that respect, I'm not an expert uh, on uh, fighting uh, corruption. But... Speaking about investment climate, uh, I think uh, we should pursue both a revolutionary way and an evolutionary way. Changing elites will take both approaches. In any country, you have the bad people, you have good people, and I would say here we're also dealing with ugly people. The bad people, you should get rid of bad people, including in the judicial system. The good people, of course, you should keep them, you should promote them as much as you can. But then we come to the evolutionary part of this, namely the ugly people. I think they should be reformed. In that respect, I think Ukraine has taken some very important steps. Look at the Ukrainian military. You will see during the last two years they have really improved uh, their way of working. It's much better today than it was two years ago. Look at the police. Not least thanks to people like Mustafa, uh, certain parts of the police in Ukraine have been uh, reformed so that bribery is not any longer possible. Um, I also think the new e-declaration system uh, will um, get rid of a lot of uh, corrupt elements. And in general, I fully agree, this is also about the political culture in any country. I, I think that's one of the reasons why we are ranking number one uh, in the world, because it's an integrated part of our political culture that... Bribery, that corruption is completely excluded. So in that respect, I think you have a lot to do, but you have taken the first very important steps. Uh, I think that uh, a point that Yuri made is worth uh, emphasizing, which is the, the salaries of public officials. The, you know, Denmark, I think, maybe in your, in your DNA, you have had this anti, you know, you have had this... Uh, uh, gene of, of honesty because all of Northern Europe is like that. But when I look at Singapore, you know, a country in the middle of countries that are deeply corrupt uh, and that, managed to, that manages to be 
extraordinarily uh, clean and transparent. If you ask them, they will say one of the most important elements. It's one element, not the only element, but is that they pay their civil servants very well. Um, a, the head of a, of a bureaucracy in, in Singapore, the equivalent of the permanent undersecretary or the, somebody like that, could make a million dollars a year because they are trying to create an environment where there is absolutely no economic incentive to bribe. And of course, you say it's very expensive. Well, actually, it's very cheap if you get rid of corruption uh, because you are actually not, you know, it's a very good, good deal if you can manage to do it. Um, I know that we are going to keep talking about all these issues, but I noticed that we have a, uh, a chance to hear from Secretary Panetta, who is going to leave later. And so I'm going to ask uh, Secretary Panetta to just offer some of his reflections. Remember, this is a man who is not just um, the Secretary of Defense, the head of the CIA, but was for many, many years a congressman, and by the way, also was the chief of staff uh, for Bill Clinton. So I think if there's a Lifetime Achievement Award, and as they give in the Oscars uh, in, for public service, Leon Panetta would get it. If somebody can get a microphone to him, please. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Fareed, and uh, thanks to all of the panelists for your, uh, for your comments. Uh, let, let me just uh, say a few words about uh, my thoughts on the challenges that face you. Uh, I, I do believe that the younger generation here holds a lot of hope. I had the opportunity to meet with young students uh, and talk with them, and my impression is that by their questions and by their dedication, that they really do care about this country uh, and its future, and so that, that's a tremendous asset for uh, the Ukraine. Uh, but I also told them that, like my country in the United States, I think uh, the Ukraine and the United States, for that matter, can go in one of two directions. Uh, this country could be a country that uh, has a strong, develops a strong economy, develops a strong government uh, without uh, the impact of corruption, develops a strong military, uh, and is able to protect its uh, security uh, and protect uh, the, the basic rights that uh, we want in a democratic society. In the United States, we could have a strong economy. Uh, we could have a, uh, a country that could govern itself, that could establish uh, the kind of investments that need to be established, protect our military, uh, and also provide world leadership in a very troubled world. Or in both cases, we could have countries in decline in which we do not achieve the goals that are important for our countries. And as I tell the students at our institute in California, I think the difference as to what path we take is whether we govern by leadership or we govern by crisis. If, we, if the leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, then you can confront crisis and deal with crisis. But if that leadership is not there, then we will inevitably govern by crisis. The dysfunction in Washington is the result of the inability of both parties to be able to sit down and work together to find the kind of consensus that needs to be found if you're going to solve problems. They would rather confront each other they would rather be ideological, and as a result, nothing gets done. And that creates the anger and the frustration that leads to uh, the kind of election we're going through in the United States. The key for this country is the same key for the United States. Parties, both representing future of this country and who care about uh, the importance of your security. All sides need to be willing to sit down and find consensus in order to govern and in order to solve the problems that confront you. If you're not willing to do that, 
you will fail. If you are willing to do that and take the risks involved with that, then there's a good chance that you can succeed. Thank you, Leon. Um, Michal, you had, you had a quick thought. I'm, we're going to run about five minutes long because I see there are so many people who want to talk. Yeah, well, just very shortly, <coughs> uh, Anders, uh, I agree with what Secretary Panetta said. And uh, I want to boast a little bit what, about what Anders said. Well, Denmark might be number one. But uh, we, in Georgia, when I was president, no country has achieved so much progress in the world in terms of fighting corruption as Georgia did in those years. And no country has not achieved so much in parallel, which is interconnected in needs of doing business. The reason I'm saying it about Ukraine, at the end of my term, and you know, in 2008, when we were attacked by Russia, uh, Medvedev said Saakashvili's political corpse, he's out, and uh, etc. In 2012, when he was confronted in Russia, Duma, about Georgian reforms, he had to say, well, we have to learn from Georgia. They, we have to admit they did some very interesting things, but it is a small country. Uh, and if Ukra Ukrainian soldiers have done miracles, they've contained Russian army on the borders of Europe. They, what they've done for the rest of Europe is comparable to what Habsburgs did for the, in the Europe at that epoch, basically. But the point here is, Ukraine can also not only contain, but win this war. But how we win this war? Only through reforms and changes. The very moment when people in um, places like Rostov or Taganrog or the others say, start to tell to the people in Donbass, like the people used to tell in Eastern, in Hungary and uh, Czech Republic uh, to people in Eastern Germany. Wait a minute, where the hell are you going to? We want to be in Ukraine because Ukraine is associated with good roads, with an absence of corruption, with police you mentioned, with uh, fast procedures, with uh, you know, open democratic spirit and uh, debate. And they will tell, we want to join Ukraine. Are you crazy? Are you running away from that country? That will be the moment when Ukraine wins the war. And it's entirely doable if we do the reforms. Thank you. All right, we are, we are really out of time, but I see there are so many people. Um, we're gonna take two quick comments and then we're gonna close the lady here and, here and then and you have to be brief. Otherwise, I'll get into trouble for having recognized you. Thank you so much. The chief prosecutor said that change in the elites doesn't mean change in of age. And I completely agree with him. I think it's about changing the principles and changing the habits. And for example, registering the apartment on its own name in the country with completely open registers, uh, or to the contrary of the registering the apartment on the accountant of the relative is a very bright example of that. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to say, I do believe that in this country we started the fight with the corruption, but it's a selective fight with the corruption especially for those who escaped or from the previous regime, which is not very toxic towards those elites and those representatives in the current government. So my question to Pat Cox, what does it take actually to, to, um, to, to break this loyalty of the law enforcement bodies uh, of the key people, the head of those people that have been ba basically elected by the current elites. Thank All right. you. We're, we're not going to have a chance for you to get the answer. You can get it privately. One last comment here. Thank you. So basically what we've heard, the two school of sorts. One might call the Knights of Long Knives. So change uh, and start from the scratch. And the other one, the alternative was, which we called evolutionary, called education, education, and once more education. So, and we, I think very important uh, addition to this was an extremely uh, vital issue of leadership. Now, I think we will misplace our debate if we will concentrate on the change of the elite. What needs to be changed is the elite's behavior. Because the real question to answer, how do we govern ourselves? How do we govern ourselves? And what we have in Ukraine, I would call a something like a lawless legality. When laws exist, but they could be ignored or twisted if the government wants it to or powerful interests want this. And that means in a simple world that in addition to the laws, the formal rules, the informal rules exist. And when we change formal rules, laws, still informal, laws, uh, law, informal rules didn't change. 
That's why the question, the rhetorical question, and the, to ask and to think through is how to make sure that the formal laws, laws are implemented and they are not bypassed through the informal rules. I think we're going to have to leave it at that. It, this has been a fascinating conversation. Again, to my mind, the most in, in, important thing here is you have high government officials who are willing to engage on these issues, who are willing to listen to the criticism. Uh, I think it's important to remember there's corruption everywhere in the world. There's corruption in China. There's corruption in Malaysia. There's corruption in Turkey. The, the, what, what Ukraine has to do is simply move in a positive direction with a certain speed and with institutional reform so that there is a sense that things are changing. Uh, I don't think the cause is hopeless. I think that it is uh, an area where, as you say, there was already progress made, and I'm sure there will be more in the years to come. Thank you all very much.